the question you can ask is, if you remove those axioms to make the theory more simple, does the theory still work? And arguably, it does not. So I'm going to take a strong view here, although it's a view that many people in philosophy and physics hold, that if you remove the measurement axioms from quantum theory and just hold on to the mathematical axiom, you don't have enough resources within the axioms to obtain the empirical content of quantum theory, which is the probabilistic predictions of measurement results. The quantum field theories that make up our standard model are the best confirmed theories we have ever had. To my view, quantum mechanics is, is an approximation. It's not exact. It works very well for small things. It doesn't work so well for big things. And it's not a deterministic theory. I agree with that. It, you certainly have probabilities coming into the theory, and into the actual facts, if you like. You have to, you have to I'm, I'm not saying it's a deterministic theory, which I don't believe it is. But the theory, I argue, is not quite right. And I think people have a lot of trouble with that. They say quantum mechanics is such a wonderful theory. Uh, you've got to try and face it and the difficulties that you have with it and somehow get your mind around it. I think that's just wrong. The quantum mechanics is not that correct. When you consider big systems, when the gravitational effects start to become important, then you see that why there are differences with quantum mechanics. It's just that, that if you try and say that the Schrodinger equation describes reality, it doesn't. It does up to a point. And with systems in which there's large, large displacements, it very rapidly gives you the wrong answer. It gives you the right answer when you consider very small things. People tend to say, well, small things, big things are made up of small things. And so the rules which apply to big things have to be deduced from those which apply to small things. I think that's not quite the right way of looking at it. General relativity is a thing which applies to big things. And the principles of general relativity are, to some extent, incompatible with those of quantum mechanics. And people say, well, quantum mechanics is about small things, and therefore you've got to trust them. But I'm saying not, neither of them is quite right, but quantum mechanics works extraordinarily well for small things. When they get bigger and bigger, it works worse because the collapse is taking... I, see, the collapse, in my view, is a, is a real physical process. It happens. And it only gives you probabilistic answers. You see, you have a superposition of the thing being here and being here. And then at a certain point, it becomes here or here. And at that point, which it becomes is probabilistic, certainly as our understanding goes. It might be something more subtle than that. That's quite possible. But the view that I would hold is that it is just probabilistic. Thank you. I, I wonder, I will follow up with Alyssa for a second before returning to Jacob here, um, a viewpoint. If you follow the idea of there being no real collapse of the many worlds interpretation, what does that mean for our conception of reality, to keep it at this level? I actually liked very much what Roger was saying earlier about these two conceptions of reality. I, I mean, I think that this, this is a really a uh, helpful point. Um, when we're talking about the interpretations of quantum mechanics, and especially yeah, if, if you believe in the many worlds interpretation, because the many worlds interpretation is predicting that there are all these versions of you, these copies of you that are in other parts of the quantum state. Because of decoherence, you can't observe them. So right, if I do a measurement, again, with looking at uh, Roger's uh, coins there, um, I'm going to see one result. I'm going to see it in one location. There's another copy of me that's seeing it in another location, but I can't interact with that. So um, I think what you would want to say is for, you know, the more kind of fundamental picture of reality, there are two realities or, you know, that all of that is part of reality, the whole quantum state. Um, but for ordinary purposes and which we care about and we're living our lives, what's real is what I can interact with. And that's the coin that I can see. So, yeah, I, no, I think that this is really, really helpful. And it's something that we should be taking more seriously. Would you like to respond to this, uh, Jacob? Yes. Um, so, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I, I've spoken with a number of philosophers and physicists over the years. Uh, including some people here at the festival. Uh, and a lot of people seem to think that their interpretation of quantum theory is just quantum theory. And yet somehow 
people are all describing quantum theory differently. So something, something doesn't quite fit here. The truth is the Everett theory is a modification to quantum theory. The Dirac von Neumann axioms uh, don't agree with the axioms of, of, uh, of, of the Everett theory. The Everett theory removes some of the axioms. That's a different theory. Now, the question you can ask is, if you remove those axioms to make the theory more simple, does the theory still work? And arguably, it does not. So I'm going to take a strong view here, although it's a view that many people in philosophy and physics hold, that if you remove the measurement axioms from quantum theory and just hold on to the mathematical axioms, the quantum state evolving in this unitary way, you don't have enough resources within the axioms to obtain the empirical content of quantum theory, which is the probabilistic predictions of measurement results. The Everett theory says that there is a universal wave function evolving in a completely deterministic way, splintering into branches that uh, interfere with each other less and less. And that's all it says. Now, we need more. We want to be able to say that the copies of us somehow experience probabilities in the right way, but you run into a problem right away. There are branches where almost everything you could imagine happens. And we're supposed to not just recover that there are different branches, but that they somehow occur with probabilities that are correct. Now, what you want to say, whatever it was trying to say in his thesis, unsuccessfully, argu arguably, is that the typical copy, the typical copy of you, will see measurements come out with patterns and frequencies that align with the predictions of the measurement axioms. But the problem is to talk about who's the typical observer presupposes a notion of probability, without which you cannot make the notion of typical make sense. All of the arguments to get probability out of the Everett approach all involve this kind of circularity. And the inevitability of the circularity is just baked into the fact that if you want to construct a deductive, rigorous argument, your conclusion cannot be logically stronger than the, prem than the premises. If you don't begin somewhere secretly with probabilities in your premises, you're not going to be able to get probabilities of a particular form out at the end. This isn't my argument. Other philosophers like John Norton have made this argument. And although Everettians will give very, very complicated book-length treatments of this, ultimately, if you read them carefully enough, you find that they entail lots of extra assumptions and circularity. So I just don't agree that the Everett approach ultimately works. All right, it sounds like Alyssa wants a response to I this. Mean, we have the born, we have the born rule. I, I, it, I have to come back to this. Quant, Everettian quantum mechanics doesn't work. It's just quantum mechanics. Everettian quantum mechanics is quantum mechanics without a collapsed postulate and without hidden variables. The quantum field theories that make up our standard model are the best confirmed theories we have ever had. That is Everettian quantum mechanics. It's quantum theory without collapses of the wave function and without hidden variables. So we have the Born rule. We have a recipe for moving from quantum states to facts about probabilities, just like everybody else. You want a derivation of the Born rule? There are very many. Yes, you can read a nice book about it. You can read The Emergent Multiverse by David Wallace and see one approach. You can look for branch counting approach in the recent papers of Simon Saunders. You can read the papers of Lev Vitamin and see the self-locating uncertainty approach. There are many ways to derive the Born rule from other All principles. arguably circular. Uh, well, that's your, that's, that's, I assigned the book that's, to the book. Yeah, to my we students, have a right. friendly, let yeah. Jacob, you're my friend. We have a friendly disagreement about this. <laughs> but to say that Everettian quantum, I just, to say that Everettian quantum mechanics or the many worlds theory doesn't work is to say that quantum field theory doesn't work. And I just, I, I, I think that, that, that I take issue with that. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, I need to quickly say, um, I'm not suggesting that quantum field theory doesn't work. Any theory that is empirically equivalent to quantum theory will also be compatible with quantum field theory. It doesn't have to be Everettian quantum mechanics. The success of quantum field theory does not establish the correctness of Everettian quantum theory. I would like to bring Roger in again, because we clearly have, a, it, it's clear disagreement on these interp interpretations. And Roger, you've clearly outlined also that you think that the quantum field theory is like, it's not quite right, as you say. How do we, how do we get to a place of sort of knowing like navigating between these interpretations, how would you suggest that we can, we can actually get to a point of uh, swaying somebody that one will actually definitively rule out? We could add five more scientists here with five different interpretations, sure. and they might all differ in their viewpoints. Uh, what do you think, Roger, about this? How, how can we move a for step forward here? Well, you see, we're so far, we're so far from testing you know, the limits of quantum mechanics, it's, it's very difficult to do. I think one of the troubles with the subject is some of the words that are used. 
observation and measurement sort of things, I think are misleading. It's not to do with an observer coming and looking at the system. That's not the point. I mean, that's maybe the Everestian view. You're, you're saying all these different worlds exist. There's no evidence whatsoever that a big thing like, you know, a person or something like that could exist in the superposition of two locations. That's much too big. The only the evidence in quantum mechanics is only for things which are pretty small. You have to be careful what you mean by small. They might be uh, big distances. What I mean by small has to do with the um, well, the, the criterion which I mentioned before, which is due to Diyoshi, basically. And you uh, say the how much energy does it cost you to move the thing from one location into the other and that sort of thing. And then you can work out how long it would take for a collapse to become one or the other. See, the collapse of the wave function, I would say, is a real phenomenon. It's not just sort of some talky talk or something. It really happens. The world does not behave according to the Schrodinger equation. Well, um, jumps from one to the other. It does, it does funny things which are not like classical physics, that's true. But it's, there's no evidence whatsoever that you could have a big object in the superposition of two different locations. And I mean, the idea is somehow that the environment is what's messing it up and you get the system much more complicated and therefore you worry about the environment. Well, that's, that's misleading too. I mean, it's part of the story, if you like, because if you set up an experiment where you don't care about what the environment does, you're in trouble. So you've got to keep it very isolated so that the environment doesn't get in the way. Uh, and then can you test whether you could have a big object in two places at once for a sort of length of time which would violate the Diyoshi criteria? There's nothing yet has got anywhere close to this. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.